Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Sam tōko ingoa. Welcome to the final talk in our MAMLP series for Biosecurity Bonanza 2022. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Andrew Veal, a wildlife ecologist at Manaki Whenua. Andrew specialises in the use of genetics to understand animal movement and ecology, and in applications of genetic technologies and conservation management. He has studied a range of species from sea anemones, chitons, salmon, stoneflies, plants, fungi, and various mammals, but the stoat is his spirit animal. This talk is on his current research program focusing on mustelid movement and genetics in collaboration with various predator-free 2050 large landscape scale projects. And in it, he asks what more is needed to achieve the goal of being predator-free by 2050. This work developed from his PhD research on stoat ecology on islands and from his recent completion of the stoat genome. A Q&A session will follow this talk. I encourage you to submit questions during the presentation. We'll try and get through them all, but if not, Andrew will respond by email to any questions we don't get to today. I'll now hand over to Andrew to share his presentation on Stoats genetics and the prospect of predator freedom. Thank you. And I can't bring up my slides. Where are they? There we go. Okay, are my slides visible? Yes, uh, go ahead. Okay, excellent. Very good. All right. Uh, Co Andrew Veal Tene. Uh, I'm a scientist at Manaki Fenua Research. And as Sam said, I'm going to be talking about genomics and stoats and predator free New Zealand. I apologize if you've been to any of my other seminars recently online. Uh, there will be some overlap, but there will be new things. Um, now, Stoats are the number one swimmer in New Zealand, and uh, they like to swim out to islands. Um, these are the islands in New Zealand to scale that stoats have been attempted to be eradicated from. Uh, what I did here was uh, the color is the distance from the nearest trap for every island. And you can see with a lot of these islands, uh, there's a lot of distance from the nearest trap. I should note that Long Island, it's not actually a eradication uh, program yet. It's just a control program. But um, you can see that there's a lot of trapping that has happened on these islands. And at times, just because of the island topography, it gets very difficult to have traps across the island evenly distributed. Uh, for Waiheke Island, uh, we basically have distributed traps evenly across the island almost, which means that uh, basically every trap's within 200 meters of, or every location on the island is within 200 meters uh, of that. And so this is something that we can learn from on the mainland on how this works and whether it works. Uh, here are graphs of the distance from a trap for each of these islands and you can see for some islands say Long Island there's quite a bit of distance or area that is distant from a trap and then for most of the other islands it's largely quite small the distance Waiheke obviously being very good Great Island being another one and then there's some that's a little bit further away now what does that actually mean in terms of success well those ones have been successful at least briefly and I say that because I think almost all of these islands have had a stoat swim to them uh, subsequent to the initial eradication. And I think all of them currently do not have stoats on them because they're being eradicated. And so the ones that haven't, if we go backwards, they're the big ones. We haven't actually successfully eradicated any of the islands bigger than Coal Island. Uh, and so we're currently trying to work on, or well, how do we scale up? And uh, that's what uh, I'm trying to research. So part of that is on the stoat genome. Uh, I sequenced the stoat genome uh, a couple of years back now. And uh, basically this is all of the DNA inside the body. You assemble it like a big jigsaw puzzle and uh, eventually you get the entire sequence in chromosomes with no gaps. That's the ideal. 
And this genome that we have produced is one of the highest quality genomes ever of a vertebrate in the world. And this is all to hopefully be able to uh, eradicate the stoat. And uh, most of you won't be geneticists, so you won't know what all of this means. But basically, we threw vast amounts of money at lots of sequencing technologies and uh, that's how you're able to produce this. Now, I can't remember how many billions of dollars the human genome initially cost back in 2000. Uh, we did this for about 50,000 worth of sequencing. Uh, and we have produced this very good genome. If anyone wants to go and uh, download it or uh, look online, you can actually browse it if that is of interest. Um, and this has led to a quantum leap in the genetic resolution that we can get. Now, this figure on the right is some work that I did with microsatellites, which are genetic markers back in my PhD. And this was looking at whether a stoat arrived on an island or it was a resident or that sort of thing. Now, that was using 17 genetic markers. And I proved that this one swam to Rangitoto from the Auckland mainland. Now, with the new markers that I've been uh, using, Waiheke Island, I got 30,000 markers, and in Taranaki, uh, close to 56,000. So you can see that 56,000 is a lot more than 17. And that means that we can do a lot finer scale relatedness and understand how those populations are linked together a lot more. Now, onto Waiheke Island. Waiheke Island, um, Te Korowai or Waiheke, uh, predator-free Waiheke Island, they are attempting to eradicate stoats and they'll eventually try to eradicate rats from this island to make the largest stoat-free island in the country uh, that has ever had stoats. Obviously some of the far offshore ones have never had them arrive because that's how they arrive, they swim there. Now the good thing about Waiheke Island is that I've, I've done genetic estimates, there is basically no immigration. They have got there sometime in the past, but there's basically no ongoing immigration. <coughs> uh, because of the trap density across this island, there should be no stoats that there isn't a trap in their home range. And what that means is that basically we can look at, well, how many stoats avoid traps, and what's the probability of going into a trap per night, per season, per sex, we can really hone down on how to do this on this island which has these perfect qualities. Something I should note is that not all traps are created equal. These are the numbers of stoats caught per trap that has caught a stoat on Waiheke Island during the eradication period. You can see one trap has caught, I think it's 24 stoats, the next highest is five, and then it goes down to four, and then most of them are just one. So there is a miracle trap on Waiheke Island that catches all the stoats. And this is something that we're also looking at is, well, what is so special about this one trap that every stoat goes into it? Currently, we're thinking it's sort of landscape features that this is sort of every, every stoat goes to that point. Uh, it's at a causeway, but uh, this is the thing. Stoats, they, they are complex animals. You can't just treat them like, oh, if you put a trap here, then it'll be close enough. Some traps are much better. Now, on Waiheke Island, uh, I have been given every single stoat caught for four years. And I've been doing genetics on all of them and also aging them and sexing them. And all of the stoats that are, this, this graph on the left here, is genetic distance or relatedness. Uh, and then on the x-axis, uh, it is geographic distance between those two samples. And everything in this yellow box, these are first order relatives. What that means is that they're parent offspring pairs or they are full siblings. And uh, this is the frequency of these distances. And you can see there's lots of ones that are caught close together. And so these are probably litters that you have caught all of the litter uh, as they start to um, leave uh, the mother. But there's also this interesting secondary peak at about 3,500 meters. And my interpretation of this, which is novel information, is that stoats will generally, when they're dispersing, run 
and then stop after about three and a half k's to go, well, is there another stoat in this area? If there's not, then they'll settle into it and then they can start to be trapped. Now, there's also ones that are going quite a far distance. So they're going up to 12 kilometers uh, in this situation. So it's not that they always just stop at about that point. It's just, if it's a nice place, then they'll try and settle into a home range that's about that distance. And we haven't seen that before because it's very hard to track stoats uh, at well, large numbers of them to see exactly how this all works. Now, this graph, which I really like, which is complex, uh, is a relatedness matrix of all of these stoats. So on the diagonal, that's the stoat versus itself. And so that should be red, which is very high relatedness. Uh, and then as you get further out, so towards yellow, they get less related. Now, um, you can see these square structures. These are individuals that are all closely uh, related to each other and they're probably litters of animals. So you can start to get uh, these. Now I should note that Waikiki Island is incredibly inbred for stoats. And if we were to do these sorts of calculations based on mainland relatedness, uh, they would all be like first cousins or closer. So you always need to know what population you're actually dealing with and do your calculations accordingly. Now, if we start looking, well, where are these litters? Uh, and I color coded them. Uh, you can see here, say light blue, that litter, it's spread across the entire island. That's what stoats are capable of. On an island this size, they can run laps on it if they really want. But most of the time you have, say these yellow ones down here, all of those were caught relatively close together. Uh, so in general, you do get these uh, siblings being caught close together. At times they do expand out. Um, now that square that I showed earlier, if we zoom in on that, you can see that there's actually two squares in this sharing one individual. What is that? Well, that's two litters sharing an individual. And this is actually one litter where the daughter in one litter was the mother in the next one and they're separate years. So you can actually get down to extremely fine scale detail of what's happening in any given area. And what does that look like? Well, the red ones are the earlier ones. And so these were born at the end of uh, 2019. And you can see they're all sort of clustered down here. And then later in the year, uh, there was a female court uh, so this is in August. And then this orange one, she was caught after the breeding. Uh, so they all give birth uh, late September on Waiheke Island because there's an annual breeding cycle. And so she was caught there and then her son was caught a couple of days later in the same trap. And then these other ones, uh, these other yellow ones are the offspring from that litter. So you can see mum was caught, then the son came into the same trap, probably because her scent was there. And then the others were slowly spread. But an important thing here is that one of these, uh, it was four months later and moved 7.3 kilometers through a dense trapping regime. So this stoat avoided traps and moved across the island and eventually settled there. So there are quite a few that are avoiding traps. Now, uh, Waiheke Island is a very good system to look at because we can parameterize all of our models. Um, and But I found that both males and females are avoiding traps for over a year. And what that means is that while these are small numbers of really clever individuals, the population is persisting because then they're born, uh, you know, another litter is born and so, so far they haven't eradicated. And if trapping ceases on the island, they'll reach carrying capacity within two years, maybe just one year if there are some large litters. So this is the best stoat trapping program in the country, and there's still ones that are avoiding it. Now, in my opinion, with dogs and cameras and lures, and they're doing a lot of toxin uh, work trying to eradicate rats, just in some pilot areas, this will probably succeed, but the trapping alone is not currently succeeding in eradication. And given the challenges here on an island that there's no immigration and it's a relatively easy terrain and highly motivated, well-funded 
uh, group, mainland operations are in trouble. Now, moving to Taranaki, uh, we've also been working there on some similar questions. Uh, and we did some radio collaring work and GPS work on them, but I'm going to talk about the genetics. And so these are samples that uh, Taranaki gave me, uh, which I have done genetics on. Now, there are male and female stoats at about the same ratio. Uh, how, and so on this map, stoats are red and weasels are orange. Um, however, the weasels were highly different in terms of this, so there were far more males than females. And what that means is that they're not catching the female weasels. This is fully expected because female weasels are about 50 to 60 grams, and the traps are set at about 100 grams minimum weight to go off. And that's just because if you start going very low, then mice will start setting it off, or the wind, and then all the traps are taken out. So this is a problem basically that uh, in Taranaki, we're not getting the female weasels and therefore the populations will rapidly increase because they'll all be pregnant and there'll be lots of litters. So that was an interesting finding. And I did that through genetically sexing all these dead weasels that they gave me. And here's these graphs again, looking at genetic distance versus geographic distance. And again, these are the ones that are first order relatives. So uh, parent offspring pairs or um, full siblings. And you can see with the graph on the left, uh, the distribution of these. So you get these ones um, at, a, you know, they're all close together. And then some are going up to 40 kilometers. So what does that look like on a map? This is a map of Taranaki. And so it's on this one is green, weasels red. And so these are the longest distances, over 40 kilometers for a stoat and over 25 kilometers for a little weasel. And this is again, across a very dense trapping regime. Now, also we know that they won't have just, you know, gone in a straight line, straight over a mountain. Uh, they will have gone a more tortuous route. And therefore there's quite a few individuals that are going very far through a lot of traps. This is probably one of the densest trapping programs in the country. Uh, and it's, again, not great news. Something else I'm using genetics for is uh, forensics. And since we have the genome, we can then develop little forensic markers to look at SCAT. And something that I did, uh, this was with Ecogene and with Auckland Council, is looking at SCAT using some of the old markers. And this was on Shakespeare Regional Park. Uh, there was a litter of stoats born there, and we were able to basically say from the scat, ah, you have two stoats left, they are males, here are their home ranges, one was then caught, and I was like, okay, well that will be individual B, and it was, and then the last one, it was never found, but they went through with lots of scat dogs and things, and it either left the park or died. But we were able to then, you know, really target things if you can start getting genetics out of SCAT, which we're developing more. Uh, something that I'm working on with uh, Brian Hopkins and uh, Erica Hendricks is using the genome to look for new targets for toxins. And effectively what we're doing is we get uh, the receptors out, we then model them and look at, well, is there a difference in this one, in, in this potentially druggable target compared to a bird or a human or a sheep? And hopefully we may be able to get this. This is early days, but that's just another thing that we're using the genome for, which I thought I'd mention. And given that uh, everyone always says, oh, genetics will be the answer, I just want to briefly talk about this. Gene drives are something that uh, predator, well, people have talked about for predator-free, and effectively you could potentially use them to make only males, and then the population will just die out. Now, this works on a generational time frame. And for stoats, the minimum generation time for males is two years, and we can't actually breed them in captivity. For possums, it's a two year minimum generation time, and they live up to 13 years. So this is not technology that we are working on in New Zealand, but I just really want to point out that if this technology, which doesn't yet exist for mammals, is tried, we are going to have stoats and possums 
into the future for 60 to 100 years if everything works perfectly and is done as quickly as possible. So for definitely for possums, they'll be here into the future longer than they have been in the past if we were to rely just on this. For rats and mice, it is possible. It's not yet a, a real technology and no one's working on it in New Zealand, but I just thought that I'd mention this. Now, for best practice in terms of eradication, um, this is my views. Uh, you need to combine toxin with trapping. We are not successfully eradicating anywhere with traps. And as I said, on Waikiki Island, in ideal circumstances, it'll be at carrying capacity within a year or two with trapping alone. I do think that they will succeed, but toxins required. Every island that has had a toxin uh, eradication so it's, has succeeded and every fence sanctuary has. So pulsed toxin in winter is probably the best option. And probably when reinvasion is likely, buy yearly pulsed toxin because there's lots of ones that just avoid traps. Uh, suppressing the rodent uh, prey species and rabbit prey, you know, rabbits and rodents is also good because it means that their populations will be lower. If you're trying to eradicate, and that's a very specific thing which is different to control, probably a 250 by 250 meter grid is required. And you really need to optimize those trap locations to get exactly the right place where a stoat might go. There are new lures coming out and we will need detector dogs, genetics from scats, cameras, and maintain all the traps indefinitely and then probably still use toxic rodents. Uh, this is just how it has to be. And in my humble opinion, for eradication of mustelids, there's only one predator-free uh, project that is actually what you know we would call an eradication, which is Waiheke Island. Everything else is a suppression to low density. Now, Otago Peninsula might eradicate ferrets because they're a little bit easier, but stoats will just swim across that harbour every day. So it'd be a very low number. And I mean, a lot of these uh, organizations like Capital Key are doing an amazing job at getting stoats low, which will then have ecological benefits, but it's not eradication. And I think that uh, with eradication, what we're trying to do is we're trying to trap, which is kind of like trying to build a human pyramid to the moon. It won't work. We need a Saturn V rocket for that. And so we need novel tools because the tools that we have will never get there. And therefore we need to be researching disease, uh, genetics, toxin distribution, social acceptability, so that we can get some of these toxins used in these situations. But currently the only mustelid eradication tool that we really have is actually aerial toxin. And a lot of this work is from many, many other people. I am just the voice for this. Uh, so, yeah, Taranaki Regional Council, um, Predator Free 2050, Landcare Research, uh, Takorawai Waiheke. So, all of these people contributed huge amounts, and thank you. Thanks for that, Andrew. Great wide ranging talk. We've got a few questions that have come in so far. So starting off, why is there no immigration of stoats to Waiheke? Is it too far for them to swim and is there no chance of them arriving via transport? I don't think there's no chance of them arriving via transport. If someone was transporting large amounts of hay in a truck that was parked up somewhere, there might be a litter of stoats in it. But uh, stoats don't get on boats. Uh, they've never successfully got to Waiheke Island or to Stewart Island, despite lots of boat traffic. They've got to basically every island within five kilometers of the shore. They swim to islands. And Waiheke is at the limit of that. And right now, uh, Ponui Island, which is a stepping stone island, is stoat free, possibly because it's covered in feral cats. Um, so they, they aren't coming back. It's very rare. And is there any evidence that trap avoidance on Waiheke is getting worse with time? It's very hard to tell. Um, I, I'm looking at that and we have effectively, when I get all of the measurements off them, I will have the exact birth date and death date for every single animal. 
and we can start looking at that. But it's a very hard thing to look at because you know just a litter size varying slightly from say five individuals to ten that's a huge difference. And uh, yeah, but it, it is possible. Uh, stoats do learn from their mother what they should eat and how they should move, and so it's possible that mum might teach them not to go into traps. So do you know what type of trap caught the 24 stoats that was uh, far more successful on Waiheke than the others? It's it's a single set Doc 200, uh, but it's the location that seems to matter. It's on this causeway at the end of a uh, wetland, and for whatever reason, that seems to be the stoat highway, and everything just funnels to this one point where they all go into a trap. Uh, so I think it's it's landscape features. It's not necessarily microhabitat exactly there. It's all of the landscape coming together to mean that that that's how they travel. And a follow-on question: What does a stoat microhabitat look like? Stoats definitely like cover. We know that, and so basically they also like the coast. Uh, so along hedgerows, edge habitat, where there's cover. They don't want uh, birds to harass them. They don't want to be eaten by foxes. They haven't realized that there aren't any here. And so basically they like cover, and uh, they do like sort of edge of wetland areas and edge of coast. Uh, so we've got someone asking if you're involved with Zip's predator-free Southwestland effort, and any thoughts on that? I'm not involved, but I do know a lot of people there. Uh, Maggie's uh, involved in that, and she's helping me write up some stoat stuff currently. Uh, I mean, it's it's a very interesting project. The thing is that they are using toxin, and toxin works. So the they, they are doing aerial toxin um, at relatively high density 1080. They are also monitoring the edges with cameras and traps. And when a stoat is recorded, they have toxic rodents, which they have filled with either 1080 or Britificum. And they put those out exactly where the stoat is. And that one toxic rodent eliminates the stoat. So if you have a lot of cameras, you can do that. Uh, and I think that pretty much every operation that is a decent 1080 operation probably actually is very close to eradicating stoats in that area. The problem is that they move so far and so fast, they come in from elsewhere. So read the genetic distance versus geographical distance graphs. Uh, greater, the greater density of points look to be at less genetic distance than the identified close kin groups. What does this mean? Um, I am not sure exactly what the question means. The With those particular graphs, you generally get lots of ones that are very close geographically, and then uh, as you get further out, there are less and less related ones. Uh, and there are these this secondary peak at about 3.5k on Waiheke Island, which is a specific situation that doesn't have many... Um, Stoats on it left. Right. Uh, I've got someone asking, uh, do stoats have any natural predators in New Zealand? Uh, some birds of prey will take them out. Uh, so probably harriers and uh, maybe ruru. Uh, cats will take them out. Um, and I think that ferrets and stoats pretty much, if they meet, they don't like each other. And then the stoats run away. Uh, so really it's just feral cats and some birds of prey, but they won't be having any effect on the population. Uh, is there thoughts or work around GPS tracking to identify these stoat highways for trap placement and efficacy? Sort of the idea of using less traps in more efficient locations? I think that that, that is good. I, I think that it's almost unavoidable to have lots of traps because there'll always be one that's somewhere that there isn't a trap, but definitely putting them in exactly the right positions uh, will mean that they're far more efficient. It's very difficult to get a GPS on a stoat. Um, this is because uh, the welfare requirements are that you can't have a big battery on them. And uh, yeah, so we, we have tried. Uh, most of the stoats were getting rid of them. We were trying to glue little um, bird ones on them. That was difficult, uh, so it's, it is very challenging to get GPSs on them. 
and I think that quite probably the best way to do it is for um, really good trappers that seem to have good success with trap placement saying, I think that this is where they go and then training others. So what's your advice for advocating for genetic based control solutions, sort of helping build social license for New Zealand research and application? I think that in New Zealand, the best chance of eradicating rodents, uh, so mice and rats, is probably genetic. Um, I think that we can't do it in any other way, probably. For stoats, I'm not sure that even that will work. Uh, and for possums, we can't actually genetically modify them yet, and it will take a very, very long time. But potentially, we can do possums with our current technology. So to me, I mean, basically, there isn't another option for rodents. And uh, I, I'm a scientist. I don't advocate for these things. Uh, it's, it's a very complex social issue. And we need to do it in a safe way if it was to be done. I think that probably what will happen is that we, we don't also have much money in New Zealand. This is a very expensive research area. So I think what's going to happen is that Australia will do it first because they've got huge mouse problems and therefore there's economic incentives for them to do it. And also the Australian public is more open to controlling them that way. And once it has been developed overseas, then we'll probably start having the discussions here on should we import these technologies. So what mainland areas have you done similar research on um, that's away from coastal areas? Uh, I, I mean, with stoats, everything's close to the coast um, because they move so far. So yeah, I'm, I'm doing Taranaki. Uh, I, I'm getting a lot of samples from the Auckland region and I will be getting samples from Capital Kiwi and uh, from across the country. I have got samples of stoats from a lot of places. And, uh, but yeah, the, the difficulty is that if you move 40 kilometers, uh, you're often cl quite close to the coast. I'm doing quite a lot of research like this on possums and I'm soon to get data for wallabies. And uh, I think that those will be even better data because they don't move so far and they will be affected by landscape features. Stoats, they move very far and who knows what they're affected by because you know they can go 40 kilometers, it's very hard. Uh, so regarding reinvasion after a standard large scale aerial 1080 operation, does your data suggest that reinvasion will happen in concentric rings about three kilometers apart? and also on several temporal pulses each year? Yeah, that, that would actually be uh, an interpretation of it, which was if you were to eliminate stoats from an area, then probably the majority of settlement would be within about 3K of the boundary. Uh, but there will be some that just go on their 40K mission for whatever reason. So there would be small numbers, and generally it's more likely to be males that go further. Uh, but yeah, probably the females would be within about that sort of range. Um, and uh, this will all happen, all, all stoats are born at about the same time of year, depending on latitude. So in the far north, it will be mid-September, and then by the bottom of the South Island, it would be mid-October, I think. And then they'll be dispersing from November to January. So that's about when you'd get this. And that's also when everyone catches them because there's high numbers at that time. So how many stoats do you think are left on Waiheke? Good question. Uh, last year, there were at least four males that survived over a year past breeding season, so into October. Um, I'd say that there's probably another maybe two males, and there's probably maybe five or six females. Uh, that's my guess. Um, what that means is though, that say six females each with litter sizes of 10, you've got 60 stoats in summer, and that's actually close to carrying capacity over winter. So you can be very close to eradication and also very close to complete failure. So if they were to stop trapping, it's not going to be a good thing. 
um, and this is the same on all the Fiordland Islands, they are getting them quite low and you get a lot of benefit. On Waikiki Island, there have been huge increases in kaka. And kaka are one of the species that are sensitive to stoats and pretty much nothing else. So it is having huge environmental effects, but they just need to get this maybe 10 total animals off the island. Um, last couple of questions. Um, have you ever used stoats or weasels um, that have been previously killed in a trap um, to lure that same trap? Uh, there, I think, is strong evidence that, that's, that the scent will uh, last. On Shakespeare, they didn't catch anything for months, and then they live trapped a stoat. Then the next night, they live trapped one and the same one, and then two days later, it was the same trap. The scent of a stoat recently being there. Of course, those stoats, you know, they were alive in the trap for quite a while and probably releasing uh, scent. Uh, that was a particularly good lure. But yes, I think that. Um, dead stoats, if they were rubbed on or outside traps, there will be scent there and that will be attractive for some time because they'll be interested. And do you think it's fair to say that every control device we deploy makes eradication a little bit harder? I don't think so. I think, I mean, the, the problem with stoats, and we've got lots of footage of this, they don't like to go into novel objects. And I went to a hui last year on stoke control and we talked about, you know, a Dock 200 in the middle of a field looking like an alien spaceship. Uh, you don't go into it. And so the problem is that there's lots of animals that just won't go into traps. And, but to me, eradication is toxin right now. And therefore it's kind of irrelevant what devices we're putting out, that's control which is useful, but if we're talking eradication, we are basically talking about toxin, and I don't think that that changes anything for them. Great. Uh, well, that's uh, all we've got for today, Andrew, so thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who has tuned in over the last four days, and thank you to Tiffany for her, all her organisation. Uh, we hope to perhaps see you all in person next year. Goodbye. Bye.